On July 25th, Abdu'l-Baha arrived at Agnes Parsons' Dublin, New Hampshire estate. During three weeks there, he gave private and small group talks and wrote letters to send all over the world. There he was able to rest, walk in the woods, shop, and cook for his friends. Mr. Parsons had a carriage and took Abdu'l-Baha for rides around beautiful Dublin Lake and through the countryside. Though he stayed with his entourage at the Parsons' house day spring, he moved to the Dublin Inn for part of his time to get more rest. Visitors arrived from Portland, Oregon, Washington, D.C., Boston, Cambridge, New York, and New Jersey. Abdu'l-Baha went to the Harrisville train station to greet them. W. W. Harmon, a leader of the Theosophists in Boston, visited. As I look back upon that time, I see him in that most majestic and sublime attitude with which those who are nearest to him are so often impressed. His almost supernatural power. One has to feel it and see it in order to understand the fullness and completeness of his majesty. Abdu'l-Baha toured a summer camp for boys in the nearby village of Chesham with Dr. Charles Hanford Henderson, the owner and director, who told Abdu'l-Baha that his was the first summer camp in the United States. Abdu'l-Baha spoke to the boys and they performed gymnastics for him. Aware of class and race distinctions in Dublin, Abdu'l-Baha arranged for African-American servants to meet at the Parsons' boathouse. 28 attended, and Abdu'l-Baha addressed them on unity and amity between blacks and whites, Mahmoud noted. He spoke of the approaching wedding of Miss Matthew, a white woman, and Mr. Gregory, a black man, which is to take place shortly. This meeting was full of joy. Abdu'l-Baha spoke at the Parsons home every afternoon to audiences as large as 75. Among those who met Abdu'l-Baha in Dublin included artists Joseph Lyndon Smith, Abbot Thayer, and George DeForest Brush, who hosted Abdu'l-Baha for lunch and later became a Baha'i. Others who met him included Franklin McVeigh, United States Secretary of the Treasury under President Taft, and Professor Raphael Pompelli, an American geologist, explorer, and Harvard professor, whose home Abdu'l-Baha visited. Pompelli's daughter, photographer Elise Pompelli Cabot, took the Dublin pictures of Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha's only public talk in Dublin was at the Unitarian Church, filled to its capacity of 300. Built in 1852, the church also served as the town meeting house. Abdul Baha paced back and forth on the platform as he spoke. Reverend Howard Colby Ives described his gestures. Never a dogmatic downward stroke of the hand, never an upraised warning finger, never the assumption of teacher to the taught, but always the encouraging upward swing of hands as though he would actually lift us up with them. And his voice, like a resonant bell of finest timbre, never loud, but of such penetrating quality that the walls of the room seemed to vibrate with its music. Agnes Parsons said, The people were motionless. So great was the power of his word. I had never seen him look as he did, nor had I ever been so impressed. Abdu'l-Baha's 50-minute address focused on true education, spiritual power, and Baha'u'llah's teachings. He chanted a prayer. Mahmoud noted, A wonderful spirit of humility seemed to permeate the building and the voice of acceptance seemed to issue from all sides. Before leaving Dublin, he attended a play, then called on various people to say goodbye. Agnes hosted a musical performance where he spoke about the spiritual power of music. 
and during the afternoon talk there was standing room only. On his last evening in Dublin, at the Pompelli home, a large group gathered for dinner. They exchanged funny stories. Abdu'l-Baha told several, saying that such stories made the difficulties easier when his family was in prison. Arca, the early days of the 20th century. Despite relative freedom, Abdu'l-Baha continues to live in conditions of hardship and danger. He is especially grieved as it is a period of sustained and barbaric persecution of the Baha'is in Persia. Physical torture and moral persecution continue for those who embrace the new faith. Even some of his own family members plot against him. In the midst of this, he continues to plant trees that bear fruit, which he offers to his friends and enemies alike. On August 17th, Abdu'l-Baha arrived in Elliott, Maine, at Greenacre, a conference center founded by Sarah Farmer to bring together people of diverse backgrounds and points of view. Sarah was the daughter of electrical genius Moses Garish Farmer and humanitarian Hannah Shapley Farmer, who established a residence for poor women and their children. Their home had been a way station on the Underground Railroad, and they knew Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, and other reformers. In 1893, at the World's Parliament of Religions, Sarah invited Swami Vivekananda and Dharman Pala to speak at Greenacre, where social reformers, educators, artists, scientists, religious seekers, and philosophers met to share ideas. The following year, Sarah dedicated Greenacre to the ideals of peace and unity and had the first known peace flag raised. Greenacre emerged as a center, if not the very heart, of liberal religion in the United States. In 1900, Sarah met Abdu'l-Baha in Akka and embraced his teachings. When Abdu'l-Baha arrived, she had not visited Greenacre in three years, having been confined to a sanatorium in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. As Abdu'l-Baha approached Greenacre by car, multicolored Japanese lanterns and 500 eager souls lined the road. He stayed in the Greenacre Inn, in a room on the third floor. After a short rest, he gave a brief talk on the investigation of reality. He then went to see Sarah Farmer in Portsmouth. According to Mahmoud, When she saw Abdu'l-Baha, she fell into such a state of rapture that every heart was moved. During his week there, Abdu'l-Baha brought Sarah Farmer to Greenacre and took her to see historic sites. A rare photograph was taken of Abdu'l-Baha kissing Sarah Farmer's cheek in the motor car. Margaret Klebs recalled, The beloved one held her in his arms, driving slowly around the Greenacre fields. Blessed are we who could witness it. Every evening, Abdu'l-Baha spoke to several hundred on the oneness of humanity, the need for world peace, and the role of love. Mahmoud reported that Abdu'l-Baha's eloquence produced a wonderful impression on the whole audience. Fortune tellers, spiritualists, and ascetics came here to spread their superstitious views. The discourse of Abdu'l-Baha completely swept away the cobwebs of superstitions. Some impostors came to see him, bowing and repenting. Fred Mortensen of Minneapolis, formerly a petty criminal and a fugitive from justice, had been introduced to the Baha'i faith by his attorney, Albert Hall. When he learned that Abdu'l-Baha was at Greenacre, Fred decided that he needed to meet him. As he had no money, he jumped a freight train. 
riding on top of and underneath trains until he arrived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He reached Greenacre head to foot, covered with soot. Arriving there, I found quite a number of people on the same mission to see Abdul Baha. I was looking around when someone exclaimed, Here he comes now! After greeting others and went about to go to his room, Abdul Baha suddenly turned to me and said, Sit down. I meekly obeyed. It seemed but a minute until Ahmad came down and said, Abdul Baha wishes to see Mr. Mortensen. I nearly wilted. I hadn't expected to be called until the very last thing. Fred entered the master's room. The two men exchanged greetings through an interpreter. He welcomed me with a smile and a warm hand clasp. His first words were, Welcome, welcome. You are very welcome. Then, are you happy? And then he asked, Did you have a pleasant journey? Of all the questions I wished to avoid, this was the one. I lifted my eyes to his, and his were as two sparkling jewels, which seemed to look into my very depths, and a wondrous light seemed to pour out. It was the light of love, and I felt relieved and very much happier. I explained to him how I rode on the trains, after which he kissed both my cheeks, gave me fruit, and kissed the dirty hat I wore. Abdul Baha said, You are my guest. At a special dinner, he seated Fred at his right, ignoring the convention of social class. Abdul Baha delighted others at Greenacre. Ahmad Sorab noted, His majestic figure became familiar, greeting everyone, whether friend or stranger, young or old, in English. How are you? Are you well? Are you happy? Are you very happy? When the answer was given, he said in good English, Very well? Very happy? All right! And then the party address laughed because he laughed. On August 19th, Abdul Baha spoke to around 300 people in a grove called the Pines, where Baha'is and others had delivered talks. He hosted 500 at a unity feast, where speaking from the Staples House porch, his melodious voice prompted people passing by to stop and listen. He went with the crowd up to the hill of Monsalvat. There, Mahmoud noted, He addressed this gathering on the necessity of founding the school for the investigation of religions which Miss Farmer wished to establish on that mountain. A picture was taken. It was an auspicious day. On August 23rd, Abdul Baha said, We have finished our work here. We have sown a seed. The suitcases were packed and the carriage readied. As they lined both sides of the road to say farewell, people lamented and wept. When Abdul Baha prepared to step into the car, he spotted Fred Mortensen. To my astonishment, he ordered me to get into the automobile. Mortensen accompanied Abdul Baha for the next week in Malden, Massachusetts. On the way, Abdul Baha stopped for one last visit with Sarah Farmer, who fell at his feet weeping. In Malden, Abdu'l-Bahá stayed at a house owned by Mariah Wilson, where he gave talks, wrote numerous letters, and received many visitors. A close friend of Sarah Farmer's, Mariah had accompanied her on her trip to Egypt and Akka and had returned for a second pilgrimage. Mariah had asked Abdu'l-Bahá to visit her if he came to America as she wished to return his hospitality. She was overjoyed that he remembered and that she could host the nine men in his entourage in her small home. 
From Malden, Abdu'l-Baha took day trips to Boston to give talks. One day he went for an automobile ride along the Atlantic coast and enjoyed its beauty. On his last full day in Malden, so many wanted to see him that his hostess asked her friend, Madame Murray, a well-known pianist, to hold a meeting in her large home nearby. The program began with music. Abdu'l-Baha spoke about the religions of the world to the nearly 100 present. One of the visitors at the Wilson home was Harry Randall, a skeptical Boston businessman who earlier had been surprised by his own response to meeting Abdu'l-Baha. He spoke in Persian and my mind heard in English. Great is the power of the intellect, but it is dead without love. It needs the vivifying fragrance of love to make it a servant of God. He then blessed me and said, be happy. Now Randall had come to Malden at the urging of his wife, Ruth, who was dying of tuberculosis. He entered the house hoping he would be able to ask Abdu'l-Baha to visit her, but it was crowded with people, and he was told Abdu'l-Baha had at least 100 requests for appointments that afternoon. Randall realized it was hopeless to wait and felt annoyed because he knew Abdu'l-Baha didn't even know he was there. Then suddenly the kitchen door opened and a voice called, Abdu'l-Baha will see Mr. Randall. Overcome, he went to the porch where Abdu'l-Baha sat. When he looked up, Randall asked, I wanted to know if you... But that was as far as he got. Abdu'l-Baha said, Yes, I will come and see your wife this afternoon. Abdu'l-Baha's visit to the Randall house was a turning point for Ruth, who recovered. The Randalls later lived in Haifa in service to the faith and to Abdu'l-Baha. On August 30th, Abdu'l-Baha left for Montreal, taking two members of his entourage. They were met at the train station by William Sutherland Maxwell, who took them to his home, where a group of friends and John Lewis, editor of the Montreal Daily Star, were waiting to see Abdu'l-Baha. The first Baha'i group in Montreal had been formed by May and Sutherland Maxwell in 1902. May, whom Abdu'l-Baha called a pearl and illumined, was the primary catalyst for his visit to Montreal. William Sutherland Maxwell was an architect who later designed the Shrine of the Bab, the golden domed monument on the side of Mount Carmel that became a focal point of the Baha'i World Center. The Maxwell home was later designated a Baha'i Shrine, the only one in the Western Hemisphere. The Maxwell's two-year-old daughter Mary remembered being so attracted to Abdu'l-Baha that it was hard to keep away from him. Mary was to become the wife of Abdu'l-Baha's grandson, Shoghi Effendi, 25 years later. In Montreal for nine days, Abdu'l-Baha continued his tireless public talks and meetings with individuals. He clearly enunciated the Baha'i principles and gave warnings about the urgent need for peace, especially in Europe, which he said was a storehouse of explosives awaiting a spark. There is no greater or more woeful ordeal in the world of humanity today than impending war. Therefore, international peace is a crucial necessity. An arbitral court of justice shall be established by which international disputes are to be settled. Through this means, all possibility of discord and war between the nations will be obviated. His addresses at the Church of the Messiah St. James Methodist Church, the Socialist Club, the Trades Union Headquarters, and at the Maxwell's home attracted widespread attention from the press and public. He spoke on economic justice, world peace, and social cohesion. At the Unitarian Church, according to Mahmoud, the pastor read verses from the book of Isaiah which allude to the appearance of a promised one from the East. Everyone listened with rapt attention and felt that they had been specifically written for this day. 
The master's address was so enthusiastically received that it is difficult to describe, especially the effect of the prayer he chanted. Prominent people who met Abdu'l-Baha in Montreal included Archbishop Louis-Joseph Bruchesi, Principal of McGill University, Sir William Peterson, Anglican vicar Herbert Simmons, and Judge Robert Stanley Weir, famous for writing the English lyrics to O Canada. More publicity was generated in Montreal than in any other location on his journey. Many of the newspaper accounts in English, French, and Yiddish are full of reverence and praise. Of everyone, even journalists, he asked support. A writer for the Toronto Star Weekly wrote, He took my hand in both of his and blessed me as a father would bless a son. I cannot succeed, were his parting words, without your help and the help of everyone who believes in the cause of universal peace and good fellowship among men. And that you may not forget me, I will ask you to accept a little gift from me. So saying, he handed me a small parcel with a handsome gold ring. It fit perfectly. One day, Abdu'l-Baha and his companions took a cable car up a mountain, which provided a magnificent sight of Montreal. Mahmoud writes, While we were here, accounts of the meetings in the newspapers were read to him. Suddenly he cried out, O Baha'u'llah, what a wonderful cause thou hast founded. It satisfies every assemblage. In the churches it shakes the souls and inspires joy in the peace meetings. It is a miracle. Later, at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Maxwell, letters from the East were given to him. Among them was a letter on the greatness and significance of the journey of the Master, who said, Yes, the value and greatness of these travels are not known now, but will be apparent later on. On September 9th, Abdu'l-Bahá set out on a long journey to the west coast. In Toronto, he stepped off the train and paced the platform, exhausted. He wondered if he could make it to California, but he continued on. In Buffalo, he went to view the great beauty of Niagara Falls before addressing 70 people at the Hotel Iroquois. He garnered much media and public attention in Buffalo. In fact, when he gave money to the poor on the street, a crowd surrounded him, recognizing him from publicity. When he spoke at the Universalist Church of the Messiah, the congregation kept him up late asking questions. On September 12th, Abdu'l-Bahá was greeted at the Chicago train station by a large crowd who formed two lines. Abdu'l-Bahá walked majestically between them, showering his blessings on each one. Sachiro Fujita, a Japanese Baha'i, had climbed a lamppost for a better view. He was called down to Abdu'l-Bahá's side and invited to ride with him to Corinne True's home. He later journeyed with Abdu'l-Bahá to California. On September 15th, when Abdu'l-Bahá and his companions took an excursion to Kenosha, Wisconsin, they missed their train. Abdu'l-Bahá said there was a wisdom in this. Later, they came upon the wreckage of the train they had missed, which had collided with another. In Kenosha, Abdu'l-Bahá spoke at a congregational church and at a luncheon where people sang songs of praise and brought their children to him to be blessed.
Next day in Chicago, he boarded a westbound train to Minneapolis and St. Paul. Abdu'l-Baha gave talks at the Plaza Hotel and addressed the Sharatov Temple about the truth of Jesus Christ and Muhammad. At the commercial club, he spoke on criteria for investigating truth. At Albert Hall's home, he spoke about ideal virtues. And at Dr. Clement Wilson's in St. Paul on spiritual education. On the drive from Minneapolis to St. Paul, he praised the beauty of the Mississippi River and the green landscape. About a thousand people heard him speak in the Twin Cities over the two full days. He toured the Walker Art Gallery with Mrs. Willis Walker and took a walk at Loring Park before leaving for Nebraska. On September 21st, Abdu'l-Bahá boarded a train to Omaha. Though there were no Baha'is there, he gave a talk to a small gathering and spoke to reporters about how a European war could be avoided. In Lincoln, two newspaper reporters interviewed him. He wanted to visit William Jennings Bryan, who had visited him in 1906. But Bryan was on the road campaigning for Woodrow Wilson, so his family entertained Abdu'l-Bahá at their estate. He visited Brian's library and wrote a prayer for the occasion. That night at his hotel, people who had read newspaper reports approached and asked questions. On trains, people often gathered around Abdu'l-Bahá to discover who he was and listen to his discourse. Once when someone asked about the purpose of his trip, he said, I have come to America to raise the standard of universal peace and the unity of mankind. My aim is to create love and harmony among the religions. They arrived in Denver on September 24th, and Abdu'l-Bahá went to rest at the Shirley Hotel before his first talk at the home of Eudora Roberts, where a large crowd gathered. Nona L. Brooks, the pastor of the Church of Divine Science, invited him to speak at her church the next day. He also went to the home of Josephine Hall Clark, a widow who had lost one child and was raising her young son on her own. After becoming a Baha'i around 1896, she had longed for Abdu'l-Bahá to come to her modest home. I had frequently dreamt that my home would become honored with the footsteps of the beloved master. A school teacher, Josephine had rushed off that morning without doing her dishes, intending to wash them before she met Abdu'l-Bahá's afternoon train. Detained at school, she found him on her front porch. She invited him in, worrying about the dishes. She motioned for him to sit, but instead he walked toward the kitchen saying, Abdu'l-Bahá would like a drink of water. He helped himself at the water pump and, returning, laughed as if to tell her she could hide nothing from him. He spoke and answered questions, then blessed the house. Today the Clark House is designated an historic Baha'i property. Next morning a rush of visitors came professors, clergymen, and philosophers. Newspapers published his picture and articles about his talks. At the Church of Divine Science that evening, Pastor Brooks came through the crowd to lead him to the pulpit. Afterwards, many people surrounded him and shook his hand. To one who visited him at the hotel, he extended an invitation. I have come to your city and found tall buildings and advancement in material civilization. Now I will lead you to my own city. Its administration is the oneness of humanity. Its law is international peace. 
That is our city, and the founder is Baha'u'llah. Of this visit to Denver, during which he spoke at least five times to perhaps a thousand people, with at least eight local newspaper articles appearing, reporter Francis Wayne in the Denver Post wrote, Certainly Denver has not in the past been honored by the presence of a godlier man than this simple-hearted Persian whose only weapon is the word. Abdu'l-Baha's last day in Denver included private meetings, a walk around downtown, and a talk at the Shirley Hotel. On September 26th, he left for Salt Lake City and San Francisco. As the Rockies were too high to pass, the train went south to Pueblo, through the Royal Gorge. Then to Leadville. then westward along the Colorado River. At Glenwood Springs, they got off. And he rested at the Hotel Colorado, a famous resort with adjacent hot springs. There they bathed in the natural springs at the Yampa Vapor Caves, which relieved Abdu'l-Bahá of his fatigue. He said, We have been to many lovely places during this journey, but because of our work we had no time to look at the scenery. Today, however, we have had a little respite. They also enjoyed strolling in the hotel garden with its lovely fish pond. Abdu'l-Bahá indicated to his companions that he would like to have lunch outside. The manager, without being asked, ordered the waiters to set up tables and serve lunch to them in the garden. Guests approached who recognized him from Denver newspapers. Others watched from their rooms and balconies. When he boarded the train at midnight, he felt much better because of the respite. The journey continued through Salt Lake City, but the state fair was in full swing, along with the conventions of the Mormon Church and the National Irrigation Congress. Utah had no Baha'is, but Feeney Paulson from Montana came to meet Abdu'l-Baha at the station. A reporter who met him at the Kenyon Hotel wrote an article in the Salt Lake City Tribune. The next day, Abdu'l-Bahá sat on the speaker's platform of the National Irrigation Congress. At the state fair, he purchased seeds to take back to the Holy Land. Feeney Paulson describes him at the state fair as a flowing robed figure with majestic bearing, followed by his oriental companions. The next morning, she left her modest accommodations at the YWCA to have tea with him at his hotel. She writes, The master served tea, saying, This is the Lord's Supper you are having with me. He also said, I am your father. That was to take the place of the father I had never remembered and whom I had so often tried to recall. 
He gave me a locket-sized likeness of himself. As a father gives a treasure to one of his children. Although the details of each person in the presence of Abdu'l-Baha are different, they are the means to the same end, spiritual progress. Incidents forgotten and hidden in the recesses of one's being, in his presence, are in a flash perceived and unobtrusively aired. Problems and burdens become non-essentials in the light of his divine love. Abdu'l-Baha was the supreme psychiatrist. Abdu'l-Bahá then embarked on the last stage of his journey west, traveling on the Central Pacific Railroad through Reno to San Francisco. While traversing the Sierra Nevada, he made a reference to the snow sheds at Donner Pass and the struggle of its pioneering members. Baha'is had also pioneered west after a letter came from Abdu'l-Bahá saying he hoped that there would be a Baha'i in every state when he came to the United States. John Wilcott had moved from Kenosha to Kendall, Montana with his elderly mother, who was also a Baha'i. John wrote detailed reports of his experiences to individuals and to the Baha'i newsletter. Dear servants of Abdu'l-Baha, I know you will be pleased to hear from this part of the West. Although the work of giving the message is rather slow, we allow no opportunity to pass. Mother and I are the only Baha'is around here, and up to this time, we have had only cowboys, shepherds, and ranchers to talk to, who live many miles apart. Some come to the tent daily, and I am now called the preacher for miles around. At first, some of them did not want to hear anything of God, but after some great hidden mysteries were explained to them, they became interested. And you would be surprised to see us sitting on a log outside or in a tent until 10 o'clock at night. This country is wild with rattlesnakes and wolves. I have killed many snakes. One was in our tent last night. We heard him rattle. We dare not sleep with an arm outside the bed. Here comes another old shepherd who likes to come here, so I must stop writing. Your servant in his name, John H. Wilcott. While there is no record of John's having met Abdu'l-Bahá, there are many stories of early Baha'is who bravely took Abdu'l-Bahá's admonitions and encouragement to heart and changed their lives accordingly. During Abdu'l-Bahá's 24 days in California, he presented his message to more than 10,000 people at colleges, churches, and homes. The Baha'is flocked to see him, and their enthusiasm, their excitement, and joy and singing surrounded him. He told them, Your love drew me to you. A house was rented for him in San Francisco where large rooms on the first floor remained crowded during his stay, and upstairs he held private interviews. Helen Goodall and her daughter Ella Cooper were among the vibrant Baha'i teachers. Their home in Oakland was a center of activity. Abdul Baha was especially delighted to meet Japanese friends in California, calling one such meeting an historic event. Kanichi Yamamoto, the first Japanese Baha'i, and Mrs. Goodall's butler, arranged for Abdul Baha to address the Japanese YMCA in Oakland. After that, Japanese inquirers were present in almost every gathering. Abdul Baha was greatly pleased with San Francisco and particularly enjoyed his visits to Golden Gate Park. He took special interest in the flowers and wildlife and often walked along the park's small lakes. After an afternoon visit to Lloyd Lake, he reported, We are in utmost joy among the friends of San Francisco. The confirmations are really overwhelming and the happiness overflowing. When he saw the remains of the marble pillars left by the 1906 earthquake, he said, 
The world and its condition will change to such a degree that nothing but a remnant, like these pillars, will remain of the previous order. On October 6th, he addressed the congregation of the First Unitarian Church, who stood respectfully as soon as he entered the church. The pastor introduced him with a statement about his life and teachings and a scriptural passage from the writings of Baha'u'llah. After his talk, he chanted an inspiring prayer. The pastor thanked him, and a crowd of people gathered around him to shake his hand. The next day, the San Francisco Examiner reported on the service. The venerable leader of the faith, which now numbers more than three million followers, looked like a patriarch of old as he stood in the pulpit and addressed the multitude in the church on peace and love for all mankind. Helen Goodall hosted several events. On Children's Day, the parlors were filled with children, adults, and fragrant flowers. The children sang for him, and he called them to him to give out candy, flowers, and envelopes with rose petals. Before his departure, a memorable feast was held in the Goodall home. According to Francis Orr Allen, The beautiful rooms were filled with tables adorned with yellow chrysanthemums and pyramids of fruit. There were 110 present, from the Bay Cities and also from Portland and Seattle. When all were seated at table, Abdu'l-Bahá requested that we partake of the food so bountifully provided, while he walked about speaking words of wisdom and love, giving us the spiritual food for which we hungered. Gathered under one roof were people of various nationalities, the young and old, meeting in love and fellowship, in devotion to the servant of God. Then from the stairs, he pronounced a benediction upon all. David Starr Jordan, the president of Leland Stanford University, came to see Abdu'l-Bahá, inviting him to speak at Stanford. On October 8th, Abdu'l-Bahá took the train to Menlo Park near Palo Alto, then rode by carriage to Stanford University, where he gave a stirring address to around 2,000 people, including students, teaching staff, administrators, civic leaders, and prominent people. Scholar H.M. Balyuzi describes the speech as one of the most powerful of his ministry. God created one earth and one mankind to people it. Man has no other habitation, but man himself has come forth and proclaimed imaginary boundary lines and territorial restrictions. We live upon this earth for a few days and then rest beneath it forever. So it is our graveyard eternally. Shall man fight for the tomb which devours him, for his eternal sepulcher? What ignorance could be greater than this? It is my hope that you, who are students in this university, may never be called upon to fight for the dust of earth, which is the tomb and sepulchre of all mankind. When Abdu'l-Bahá had finished speaking, the thunderous applause and expressions of enthusiasm were striking. President Jordan gave Abdu'l-Bahá a tour of the campus and then hosted a luncheon at his residence. Lua Getzinger, writing a letter to Agnes Parsons that day, recounted, my dearest Agnes, we have had the most wonderful day with Abdu'l-Bahá here. This morning he spoke to 1,500 students. His subject was international peace, and such splendid attention was paid him. When he finished, they cheered and cheered until he arose, and then the whole audience rose, and the students gave the college yell. It was perfectly splendid. Your devoted Lua. An entire edition of the Palo Alton was devoted to articles concerning Abdu'l-Bahá's visit, with transcriptions of his talks on peace and unity. Those who pray for the kingdom of God on earth may see in Abbas Effendi, one who dwells in that kingdom consciously and creates an environment pulsating with a peace that passeth ordinary understanding. At the University of California at Berkeley, he enjoyed visiting the Greek theater. Everywhere he went, people were drawn to him and inquired about him. Ramona Allen Brown tried to describe him, but she says, How can anyone describe him? Each one of us saw him with our own spiritual and physical eyes. In the Master's presence, I felt as though I were in another world. Despite his advanced age and the vicissitudes he'd endured, his carriage was majestic 
and his posture remarkable. He was strong and vibrant. When his face was in repose, his eyes looked sad and showed the suffering he had endured. However, when Abdu'l-Baha smiled, the sadness vanished, and one saw only glorious beauty. He loved the sound of laughter and often told stories and anecdotes to make us laugh. In San Francisco, Abdu'l-Baha spoke at the Open Forum, where his discourse was scientific. He also spoke before the Theosophical Society, in the Reading Room of the Blind, and to a group of physicians on the use of diet to cure diseases. Abdu'l-Baha addressed the Century Club on equality between men and women. He spoke of women's superiority in kindness and tenderness and in valor and courage. Abdu'l-Baha spoke at the First Congregational Church of Oakland. He also spoke to a large gathering at a high school in Berkeley. On October 12th, Abdu'l-Baha, introduced by Rabbi Martin Meyer, delivered an address at Temple Emmanuel to a Jewish congregation of some 2,000 people. Francis Orr Allen reported, It was a wonderful sight. Abdu'l-Baha standing in the pulpit of that magnificent synagogue, he proved to the congregation the validity of Christ. He urged them to respect the name of Christ and of Muhammad. Willard Hatch, sitting in the balcony, also described it. The scene was dramatic. Abdu'l-Baha showed that the Prophet Muhammad was the upholder of Moses and Christ that to be unprejudiced promotes the welfare of mankind. Mahmoud called the talk a miracle and also noted that afterwards there was unity and communication between Jews and Christians. One morning, Abdu'l-Baha visited the humble home of Charles Tinsley, an African-American man confined to his bed with a broken leg. Abdu'l-Baha told him a story of a ruler who trained the subject he loved best by causing him sorrow and suffering, that he might be fit for the great place the ruler had destined him to fill. He added, Even so with you. After this ordeal, you will soon recover and be spiritually stronger than ever before. You will work for God and carry the message to many of your people. He never forgot that visit with Abdu'l-Baha. On October 14th, Abdu'l-Baha began a two-day stay at Phoebe Hearst's estate in Pleasanton, the Hacienda. He spoke informally several times to Hearst's guests, some of the elite of California society, and also took walks through the gardens and rides through the countryside. There, with an American presidential election imminent, Abdu'l-Baha described the sort of person who should be elected to the presidency. The president must be a man who does not insistently seek the presidency. He should be a person free from all thoughts of name and rank. Rather, he should say, I am unworthy and incapable of this position and cannot bear this great burden. The president must be a well-wisher of all and not a self-seeking person. In Washington, D.C., he had also touched on the topic, asking Florence Kahn, what would you say if a woman were to become president of the United States? Abdu'l-Baha then said, The time will come when the presidency will go begging. So advanced will civilization have become that no one will want to leave his social and humanitarian tasks to take the time to assume the presidency. On his last day at the Hacienda, Abdu'l-Baha asked to meet with the servants. To the astonishment of Hearst's guests, he spoke to the servants and gave each a generous tip. Robert Turner, 
the first African-American Baha'i and the butler of Phoebe Hearst, had met Abdul Baha in the Holy Land in 1898, where Abdul Baha greeted him with joy. Near Santa Cruz, Abdul Baha met with John and Louise Bosch, whose home a decade later would become a Baha'i school. On October 18th, Abdul Baha made a special trip south to Los Angeles to visit the grave of Thornton Chase, the first American Baha'i. He had died several weeks earlier. The next morning, he went with a group of Baha'is to the cemetery and walked directly to the gravesite without being told its location, covered it with flowers and chanted Baha'i prayers. Then he knelt on the ground and kissed the tombstone. Harriet Klein was present. As Abdul Baha knelt and kissed the soil which covered all that was mortal about Thornton Chase, I felt he had made holy all the soil of my native state. Abdul Baha told those gathered that future years would reveal the stature of Thornton Chase and they should visit his grave every year. During his remaining stay in Los Angeles at the Hotel Lancashire, people and the press continued to seek him out. Visiting Pasadena, he enjoyed the serenity and beauty of Bush Gardens. Back in Oakland, a farewell meeting was held at the Goodall home. Ramona Allen Brown describes how, during his final address, his eyes became luminous and with great authority, he spelled out his relationship to Baha'u'llah as the center of his covenant. His last stop in California was Sacramento. In a talk at the Hotel Sacramento, he condemned the violence in the Balkans and warned that Europe was a powder keg and a much greater and more destructive war was inevitable. Then he affirmed, May the first flag of international peace be upraised in this state. Decades later, in 1945, the United Nations flag was hoisted for the first time in San Francisco. Abdul Baha left California on October 26th. His work in America, he said, was accomplished. When Abdul Baha left California, only 40 days remained of his North American travels. During the next two weeks, he traveled over 3,000 miles by train, stopping in five cities before returning to New York. His days on the train were eventful. Travelers recognized him from publicity, as did crew members from his earlier journeys. People sought his company, and he spoke to small groups about spiritual matters. When he arrived again in Denver on October 29th, friends and reporters thronged to the Oxford Hotel. The next day he spoke at the Roberts home and at the Universalist Church. The train reached Chicago on October 31st. Abdul Baha gave three public talks in Chicago over five days. He spoke of the greatness of the age and of the oneness of humanity. Rabindranath Tagore, who in 1913 became the first non-European to win the Nobel Prize in Literature, met Abdul Baha in Chicago. Years later, Tagore expressed deep love and appreciation for him. Abdul Baha also spoke at Corinne True's house where he described his happiness in seeing the Chicago Baha'is again. My third visit here expresses the degree of my longing to see you and the extent of my love. I hope that these visits may be productive of future results. Describing a gathering at the home of Beatrice Davies, Mahmoud notes, It is not possible to describe the impact on the minds 
the exhilaration of the spirits and the delight of the souls. When his automobile left, everyone wept and expressed their sorrow at their separation from their beloved. In Cincinnati, Abdu'l-Bahá spoke to over 500 people at the Grand Hotel. Then at a banquet for him, his entourage, and the Cincinnati Baha'is. He had informal conversations late into the night, and 40 local Baha'is stayed at the hotel to be near him. The next morning, he spoke to them about the future Universal House of Justice, and in a public talk called America to be the standard bearer of peace throughout the world. The next day, November 6th, the Cincinnati Enquirer reported that Dr. Baha had spoken, and also that Woodrow Wilson had been elected president. In Washington, D.C., for five days, he gave at least 13 talks to large groups and met with small groups and individuals. He spoke at the Universalist Church and at the 8th Street Temple Synagogue, where the mention of Christ created a stir. Agnes Parsons described the atmosphere as electrical. On November 9th, the Baha'is held a banquet at Rauscher's Hall where diverse races could attend. Abdu'l Baha walked among the 300 present, anointing them with attar of rose and distributing candy and flowers. Abdu'l-Bahá traveled to Baltimore on November 11th, arriving at Camden Station, then went to the fashionable Hotel Rennert, where he met the press and rested. He spoke at the Unitarian Church to Johns Hopkins professors, business and professional men, and Baha'is on the unity of religions. The Baltimore Sun illustrated the impressive manner of his delivery, his voice low and rising for emphasis, his pauses for the interpreter, and his gestures that demonstrated universalism. He declared that the nations looked to America as the leader of a world movement. He had lunch with around 55 people at the home of Howard and Hebe Struven. Afterwards, with arms outstretched, he declared, Many friends have I in Baltimore. At three, he left Baltimore with his entourage. He wired the friends in Philadelphia to meet him at the station. On the platform, they rushed to him joyfully and some rode to the next stop with him, stirring great curiosity. In New York, a great rush of visitors came to see him and when he was too tired, he would go alone to the gardens at Riverside Park. Though invited to the homes of socially prominent New Yorkers, Abdu'l-Bahá preferred to visit the poor. He did, however, visit Andrew Carnegie in his home. And on November 19th, the New York Times reported that Abdu'l-Bahá visited the library of financier J.P. Morgan. And wrote a blessing in his album. O oh, thou generous Lord, verily this famous personage has done considerable philanthropy. Render him great and dear in thy kingdom. Make him happy and joyous in both worlds. Confirm him in serving the oneness, the world of humanity, and submerge him in the sea of thy favors.
A farewell banquet was held on November 23rd at the Great Northern Hotel, attended by more than 300. The hall was regally decorated, the table shone with crystal. But when the hotel proprietor realized that African Americans had been invited, he refused to allow them to come. Perhaps not wanting to disappoint all the other guests, Abdu'l-Bahá allowed the banquet to be held, but spoke passionately on the oneness of humanity. Abdu'l-Bahá arranged for a banquet for the African Americans the next night at the home of the Kennys. Many white women came forward to cook for and serve the guests, showering them with love. In 1912, this was an unusual occasion, held before the Harlem Renaissance and long before the Civil Rights Movement. Abdu'l-Bahá said, Behold what an influence and effect the words of Baha'u'llah have had upon the hearts, that hating and shunning have been forgotten, that prejudices have been obliterated to such an extent that you arose to serve one another with great sincerity. Mahmoud notes, the Master's words made a great impression. The meeting demonstrated the power and influence of the cause in uniting in sincerity and love two races. On December 2nd, he told a gathering, These are the days of my farewell to you. You must manifest complete love and affection toward all. Do not exalt yourselves above others, but consider all as your equals. Be filled with love for every race and be kind toward the people of all nationalities. Be as a lamp shining forth with the light of the virtues of the world of humanity. On December 4th, his last night in America, he spoke to the Theosophical Society. I have received the greatest kindness from the American people. I look upon them as a noble nation, capable of every perfection. Now I bid farewell to you all, and I pray that you may attain the highest station of humanity. I shall never forget you. You shall always live in my thought. On December 5th, after 239 days, Abdu'l-Bahá left America. The New York dock alongside the SS Celtic was crowded with people, many distressed and in tears. Some, like Juliet, were heartbroken. It was death to leave that ship. I stood on the pier, tears blurring my sight. Through them, I could see the Master waving a patient hand to us. It waved and waved, that beautiful patient hand, till the figure was lost to sight. For the next six months, he continued to travel on to England, Scotland, and France, Germany, Austria, and Hungary, presenting the Baha'i message of universal peace and unity. His prediction that the European powder keg would explode soon came true. During this terrible war, he returned to Ottoman Palestine, a land torn by both famine and warfare. Once again, the Turks considered him a great danger, threatening him with crucifixion. Through it all, Abdu'l-Bahá continued his lifelong service. Having trained Baha'is in the Holy Land to raise and store grain in the pre-war years, he now used that grain to feed the hungry, including soldiers of all nationalities and he oversaw medical stations. After the war, Abdu'l-Bahá was knighted by the British monarch for his famine relief efforts. November 28th, 1921. Abdul Baha passes away. 
The Holy Land, often convulsed by religious conflict, witnesses an unprecedented event of unity and collective emotion. As Jews, Christians, Muslims, Baha'is, Arabs, Turks, Kurds, Armenians, and other ethnic groups, and prominent leaders from the nations around the world, over 10,000 in all, attend his funeral, peacefully grieving his death, but rejoicing in his life. Abdu'l-Bahá proved unique in religious history. While some wanted to acclaim him as a prophet, messiah, or messenger of God, and some described him as Christ-like or as a divine father, he himself declared that his station was that of servant, reflected in his very name, which means servant of glory. In time, his luminous journey will be more fully entwined with the history and destiny of North America. This is a new cycle of human power. All the horizons of the world are luminous, and the world will become indeed as a garden and a paradise. It is the hour of unity, and of the drawing together of all races and all classes. The gift of God to this enlightened age is the knowledge of the oneness of mankind and of the fundamental oneness of religion. War shall cease between nations and the most great peace shall come. My name is Abdul Baha. My qualification is Abdul Baha. My reality is Abdul Baha. Servitude to all the human race, my perpetual religion. No name, no title, no mention, no commendation have I except Abdul Baha. This is my longing. This is my greatest yearning. This is my eternal life.